Amen. Come on, make a joyful noise to the Lord today. God is so good. God is so good. Amen. So very thankful for each of you who have gathered here this morning for first word. God has been doing amazing things. Even another one baptized in the name of Jesus last night. We're so thankful. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. We have had people to come to God that have one situation specific. When our te outreach team was out while they were praying, a man was there and and uh, they noticed him, went and prayed for him. He was crying and he was at the edge of his life. He said, when you began to pray, and he said, I was getting ready to take my life. And, um, but when they began to pray, God gave him hope. He felt the presence of the Lord. He came to church this past week, was baptized, repented, was baptized in Jesus' name, and God filled him with the Holy Ghost. Can you clap your hands and shout unto the Lord? For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. And so we are, we are so thankful for that. The book of Ezekiel, if you will turn there with me, the book of Ezekiel chapter 22, reading with verse 30. Ezekiel chapter 22, reading with verse 30 and, um, 30 and 31. To all of our guests, we welcome you here today. So thankful that you are here. The Bible tells us in verse 30 of Ezekiel chapter 22, And I sought for a man among them. Do you see it? I sought for a man. Who sought? God sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge, stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore... Have I poured out my indignation upon them? I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Why? He said, because I looked for somebody that would stand in the gap and pray a prayer of intercession to pray mercy and grace. God, don't judge these people. Don't let that come to pass. God, grant them mercy and grace instead of indignation and wrath. And, and God said, I look for somebody to be the hedge. I look for somebody to be the mediator. I look for somebody to stand in that place. He said, but I found none. And I want to talk to you today on simply about standing in the gap. Prayer changes things. Do you believe that? Prayer changes things. We've got an access to the throne of God today. The Bible says to come boldly to the throne of God that you may obtain mercy and to find grace and the help in time of need. Would you lift your hands and ask God to speak to us? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. I pray, God, today that you would help us, O oh Lord, to be in this room today, O oh God. God, that you would speak to our spirit and speak to our heart today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody says, Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Today, I would like to talk to you, and, and I will connect to the story about Jehoshaphat that I taught on last week about praising until the Lord comes. We're not just going to sit idle. Jesus is coming, called the rapture is the coming of Christ. We're not just going to sit and wait. We're not going to just beg God to come so we won't be lost. Although we are a strong people, the church is going to thrive in the end time. We are living in the end time. Even, even non-church people know something's going on with the chaos and the confusion. Even the presentation at the Olympics of against God, against Christ, the Last Supper, making a mockery of Christ. You notice they didn't, they didn't, mock, they didn't mock Buddha. You know why? Because the devil knows there's one God. The Antichrist spirit is against the things of God. And the devil can try to say whatever he wants to with all deception that he wants, but we are among a people that's going to magnify the name of Jesus till he comes. We're going to lift him up. He is holy. He is righteous. He is pure. By his stripes we are healed. By his resurrection power our lives can be transformed. Can you shout amen? And so today I bring to you that the responsibility of the believer, 
The responsibility of the church is that God looks for somebody that will stand in the gap between the Lord and a city, the Lord and a people, between the Lord and our family. In Solomon's dedication of the temple, this wonder of the world, this magnificent facility, this temple that he built was to bring honor and glory to the name of God. It was strategically lo located in Jerusalem. Why? Because if you wanted to get from Europe to Africa by land, you had to go through Jerusalem. If you wanted to get from Europe to Asia, you had to go through Jerusalem. If you want to get from Asia to Africa or Europe, you had to go through Jerusalem. He strategically placed his name there because he wanted the world to know who he is among his people. Amen. Amen. God's name is to be glorified and is to be magnified. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He doesn't play second fiddle to anything in your life. He's either first of all or he's not at all. He's got to be number one above anything else in your world. God chooses to be number one in your life. Somebody say amen. I heard dad, you say it years ago, Jesus is not my co-pilot, he's my pilot. He is leading the way. Would you clap your hands and praise him today? He is ordering my steps. I am following his way. When you begin to look at Solomon's temple in his dedication, he, I, will, I will not read it, I will just reference it, but in his dedication to the temple, he said this in his prayer. He said, Lord, let this place be such a place that if your people turn to other gods, serve other idols, they go away from you, sin comes into their life. He said, let this place be a place that, that when judgment comes against them, that Lord, because they've walked away from you, they, they, they've turned to other gods, because they've walked away from you and you shut up the heavens that it won't rain. I mean, know oh, that happened in Samaria. That you shut up the heavens that it won't rain. Oh, Lord, I pray that when they look back to this place and they repent and they turn from their sin, that you open the heavens up and let it begin to rain again. He said, Lord, if judgment comes against these people because they've sinned, they've turned to other gods and pestilence or disease comes against them. He said, let this be a place that when they turn from their sin, turn from their idolatry and they come back, that you will remove the pestilence or the disease from their life. He said, Lord, if because they walked away from you and their sin and they've chosen their own path and you allow uh, 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 them to fall into captivity or into war or into battle, into loss. He said, Lord, when they get to that point and realize that they have turned from you and their life is the way it is because they're trying to live their life without you, a life of sin. Did I tell you the pleasure of sin is only for a season? Amen. Raised in the church is the greatest blessing because you can avoid a bunch of the junk of the world. How I many know that? But there are people that sometimes they are raised in this that the devil deceives them and makes them think that they're missing out on some party or some bar or fornication or adultery or whatever is out there. They get in their mind, it's going to be fun. The church has kept me away from this. The church only kept you away from bondage, kept you away from addiction, kept you away from chaos and fear and oppression. But when you follow sin, sin's going to feel amazing. Sin's going to seem accepting. Sin's going to be, oh, it's going to feel good to you. But the problem is, sin is, the pleasure of sin is for a season and it ends in bondage. It's the bondage that will cause you to realize, I miss the church. The prodigal son came to a point when he had spent everything he had. He said, but I'm going to go to the Father. I'm going back to where the one, amen, gave me everything that I have. The world, I've lost everything to the world. I'm going home. I'm glad to tell you today, Solomon's dedication of the temple was about this. You can come home. You can return to the Father. You can return to God. It doesn't matter how far you've been away how broken you become you can come back to him somebody say amen 
I pastor a host of amazing people. You were in the church, you walked away from God, but somewhere God began to gather you back to him when you begin to call on his name. I come to tell you, you're not too far away from God that you can't call on him and he won't hear your cry. His arm is not short that he cannot reach. His eyes, his eyes are not dim that he cannot see. His ear is not dull that he cannot hear. Amen. He said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, shall be saved. I come to tell you, call on him. He'll respond to you. Solomon set the precedent in prayer. He said, Lord, let this place be that when people fall away on their own path, for the way, the Bible says, the way of the transgressor is hard. You know what that means? Those that know the law, they'll walk away from the law and live their own life of immorality. They live, it's a hard path. He that knoweth to, to, to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. And he said, Lord, those people that have walked away, went away, live in their own life. The United States of America that has walked away from biblical principles. I'm glad there's still people that are going to the house of God. And you hear me what I'm going to tell you. Don't you pay attention to everything in the news, everything they're saying as if everybody's going that way. Not everybody's woke. Not everybody's accepting the Antichrist. Not everybody's going that direction. Not everybody's voting that way, thinking that way, or living that way. In the middle of this country, there is the church of Jesus Christ that stands in the gap for a nation. Stand in the gap for a nation. And when he makes this petition, I'm not giving up on this country. We are seeing all over this city, Dad, we are seeing all over this people, people that are hungry for God. People that are hungry for God. People that are wanting prayer. People that are believing God. People that are backslid away from the Lord. They said, I know I need to be at the house of God. They're not all deceived. They're not all, oh, they're not all against the things of Christ. And, and Solomon in his prayer, he makes this statement. Lord, no matter where they are, if they'll look back at this place, that place, altar of sacrifice, that place where they made a covenant, that place where they had a commitment, that place where your name is, north, south, east, or west, no matter where they're at, when they look back at this place, if they will call on your name, I'm I'm asking you to respond to them. And 2 Chronicles 7 and 14 is the response of that because it was so powerful that when Solomon made an end of the, of the sacrifices on the altar and the prayer and prayed these prayers, the glory of the Lord came into that house and filled it. I'm just going to make a statement here today. I don't want to go to a church where there's no glory of God. This place is about God and God alone. This is about worshiping Him. This is about the Lord. This is not about me. It's not about you. It's all about him. And when the spirit of the Lord filled that place and God spoke to Solomon and this is what he said in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and 14. Look what it says. If my people, this is God speaking to, the, to, to Solomon the king. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. Humble themselves and pray. Humble themselves and pray. I need God. I need the Lord in my life. I can't do it without him. I've tried it my own way, but I just can't do it without him. Look, look, look where my journey and my decisions have led to. It's brokenness and bondage and sickness and chaos. I, I can't stay here any longer. But the Lord said, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and what? Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You don't have to live six months to prove to him that you're going to do right to be forgiven. At one prayer, you can be forgiven. At one turning moment, say, God, I can't take it anymore without you. I need you. And you know what the Lord said? Come to me and I'm going to heal every brokenness. I'm going to step in your life. I'm going to rebuke the devour that's been in your world. How many believe he can do that? He can do it. Come on, 
If he's ever done it for you, I think you ought to praise him. If he's ever done what I preach for you, you ought to just thank him right now. I was away, but I came back to the Lord. He made a way for me where there was no way. Somebody shout hallelujah. I want us to be that to this city. I want this church to be that to this region. I want it to be such a place that those that have sinned and walked away from God, those that maybe used to preach, teach, sing, lead, raised in this, worshipped in this church, taught Bible studies, whatever, but somehow went the wrong direction. That if the moment, no matter how far they're away, away from God, maybe they're at the bar last night, Maybe some were at the drug house last night. Maybe some were at a street corner somewhere yesterday not doing what they should be doing. Maybe some are just busy with trying to, trying to get the wealth that they desire. But they're away from God, not considering God. But when they come to the moment and say, I can't live without God any longer, they will know I can go back to the house of God and God can remove everything in my life that's wrong and give me everything in my life that I need. You know why marriages fail? They try to do it without God. Families fail. They try to do it without God. They try to put themselves before him. And what you will find is that Solomon's prayer set a precedent. You cannot do this without God. Tell your neighbor you can't do this without God. There was a king that, that by the name of Jehoshaphat, I preached about him last, preached about him last, last week. Aren't you glad your name's not Jehoshaphat? Life could be worse, amen. Jehoshaphat just simply meant judge. God called him to bring judgment. His father's name was Asa. His father's name was Asa, a king that had victories from God when he sought the Lord, but when he sought, the, when he sought his neighbor to be a resource to him instead of God, Judgment came against him. Asa sought the things of God. Matter of fact, in this you'll find that there was a disease that started in his feet. Started in his feet and not one time did he seek the Lord. He only sought the physicians. And Jehoshaphat watches this situation in his father. A man that has the law, the things of God but would not seek the Lord. He would only seek what the world would seek. And Jehoshaphat in his stead becomes the king of Judah. And this man, this man, the Bible tells us in chapter 20 of 2 Chronicles, verse 3, it says that Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all of Judea. He set himself to seek God. Last week I talked about the battle's not yours, it belongs to the Lord. How many believe that? We talked about praising him. They didn't draw a sword, they had a great victory. But Jehoshaphat was one of those kings that his heart was after King David. He was a righteous man. You don't find a lot of righteous kings when you study them. How many know it's true? But he was specific. He was fulfilling his rule, role as as a king, he became what I'm preaching to you today. He became one of those that stood in the gap. He stood between uh, a people that have been led astray. How many know you can be led astray, not just go astray? Be careful. Be careful who you let speak into your life. The Bible says, know them that labor among you. You, you will find even in Jehoshaphat's leadership that there was a king that was at Israel and in Samaria. His name was Ahab. You know, you know Ahab and Jezebel. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. Ahab's the king in Samaria of Israel. And you will find that during this time that Jehoshaphat and Ahab got together because Jehoshaphat wanted to hear from the Lord. And Jehoshaphat connected with Ahab and he said, do you have any prophets among you? Oh yeah, we've got many prophets. Just look around, a lot of, a lot of prophets here. And he said, do you have any prophets that can hear from God? He said, well, there's one, but I hate him. That's what he said, I hate him. Matter of fact, I threw him in prison. Why would you throw him in prison for? He said, because he never tells me what I want to hear.
He said, well, go get him. He said, because if we're going to go up to this battle together, I need to hear from the Lord. And the Bible says that there was a lying spirit that came into the prophets. And they came down and they told Ahab and Jehoshaphat, go ahead and go up to the battle. You're going you're to conquer the Syrian. Just, just go ahead. God's going to bless you. He's in sin. His heart's away from the Lord. Yet he's got people that hear from God that's telling how amazing he is. The Bible says in the last days, Timothy, I warn you, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Don't you just let anybody, because in that day, there are going to be people that will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, meaning they will go find somebody that's going to tell them how good they're doing when they're not right with God. Oh, I come to you today with a warning. You better be careful because you can find somebody to prophesy a blessing on you when you're not along, right with the Lord. You got to make up in your mind, do I want to feel good about what I'm doing or do I need somebody in my life that's going to tell me what I need to do to be right with God? Come on. Do you want me to tell you how great you are? Or do you want me to tell you what the Lord is saying about where you're living right now? Preacher, get me right. Don't you let me be lost. Tell me what thus saith the Lord. Preach to me, preacher. Hallelujah. Imagine having that prophet's job. All the prophets who are hirelings, really, and a lying spirit. The Bible says a lying spirit had come to them. Told them how great he was, how great victory. Just go ahead and go on. And he comes in and mockery sort of tells them the same thing. Just go on. You're going to be blessed. And the king knows him. What do you really want to tell me? He says, here's what I'm going to tell you. He said, the Lord showed me in a dream. He showed me in the, in the heavens. I saw a vision. I saw them like a sheep with no shepherd. Let me tell you what God showed me. God showed me a people in Samaria that don't have a leader. He's rebuking him. No wonder he doesn't like him. But he's telling him what God showed him. And he, he gets angry and Jehoshaphat's there. There's two kings sitting there in the throne room. And you've got this prophet that comes in that denies what all the other prophets have said. And Jehoshaphat is sitting there listening to this. And Ahab says, well, he said, take him and throw him in prison. He said, when I get back, and he interrupts the king, he said, he said, if you come back, I'm a false prophet because you're going to die. Well, we don't want that type of preaching at the anchor church. Just tell me how great I'm going to be away from God. I'm going to tell you right now, some of you are away from God and you know it, but you want to feel good about it. Culture has come in and you've accepted the ways of the world and not the ways of God. You're away from devotion, you're away from Bible reading, you're away from church, you're away from things deep down you know. And you want to feel good about where you are. But I hear something right now. This church has been praying as much as it's ever been praying in 80 some years and I'm thankful for it. But you listen to me. I want to be right with God. Don't tell me I'm doing good. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every man to his own lust. Can I ask you a question? If Jesus came today, are you ready? If you stood before God today and gave an account for your life, would you be leaning on the ways of the world like Asa or would you be leaning on the ways of God? Would you be leaning on intellect and what you want or on what God and what he wants? Are you calling on them or are you calling on him? When you have a tragedy, who do you call first? Is it God or is it your resource? Because God's anger with Asa is that he depended on resources and physicians and not him. 
And if we're not careful, we'll become Americanized. And if I have enough money, if I know the right people, if I can get the smartest guy in town, if I can get the right doctor, could I tell you I'm not against doctors, I'm not against physicians. They have been a blessing to me personally. I've, I've recently even went to see a cardiologist, Dr. Poole. I'm thankful for him. I'm not against doctors. Do not misunderstand. But it's all right that I say I'm going to call for the elders of the church and I'm going to call on the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith can heal me. we got to call on the Lord before we call on anybody else. I'm calling on him. God can use the doctor to heal me, but I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. He is my resource. Somebody shout, he's my resource. Jehoshaphat hears the prophet. If you come back and you know what? Ahab goes out and he disguises himself. He said, why don't we change clothes? How many know that? Because we are going to battle. There's a little bit of fear in him, I think he, he thought. But he said, Jehoshaphat, you put on my outfit and I'll dress. I, I, I'm, I'm going to dress. I'm going to let them think you're me. I'm, I'm, what a friend. The prophet just said you're going to die. Won't you wear my clothes? Wear my robe, my hat. And the Bible says they gathered around Jehoshaphat, but the Lord was with Jehoshaphat. And they recognized it was not Ahab. And somewhere, I'm a, you can't run from the judgment of God. And somewhere a man, an adventure with a bow, shot the arrow. And judgment came and found its way. Found its way and struck Ahab and he died. Do you know that God sent him a prophet that stood in the gap? And when he said, Ahab, don't do this, don't do that. He hated him instead of loved him. But you know what he was doing? He was reaching for him. Between God's judgment over his rebellious life and Ahab, God sent him a preacher. All he had to do was get on his knees and say, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. He had done it before. I'm wrong! I hate God in my life. If you could only understand the power of responding to a man of God, the word of God, the intercessor in your life, somebody that stands in the gap for you, somebody that laid awake for three hours praying for you so you would not fall into the judgment of God. When you get a phone call, when you get reached out, when you come to church and hear a message, when a prophet comes to this pulpit and he says, I've heard from the Lord, everybody ought to lean forward. I said, oh, here we go again. Boy, be careful because we're living in a culture that does not want to hear from God. Let's hear from man. But the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. You can still get a direct word from heaven if you want it. You can still get, you can get one even if you don't want it. But I want to hear what he's saying. There was, there was a time in my life, in my mind, I thought God called a pastor to be the pastor of the people that gather into a building. That was the limitations of, of a mediator or the role of a pastor is that he just oversees what's in the building. Then I come to understand later in my spiritual maturity that God didn't just call us to, as a pastor to, to, to be intercessors or mediator to stand in the gap between God and, and a group of people that show up on Sunday. It's bigger than that. He can, call, he can call a mediator's stand between God and a region or a city. And I do believe, even this morning, I begin to plead to God for, for Zanesville. God, don't let them be lost. I think of Abraham who God came to and he said, I'm going to bring judgment to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham got a hold of God. Oh, Lord, God, God, please hear me today. If there's 50 righteous, will you spare the city? Oh, yeah, I'll spare the city. God, if there's, oh, Lord, please don't be upset with me. But God, if there's 45 people in that city, will you spare the city? God said, I'll spare the city. Judgment's coming, but I'll spare the city for 45. He worked it all the way down to 10 because he knew he had 10 family members that were there. The power of a man in the gap. Why did God show Abraham he was going to destroy Sodom. I'm going to tell you why. So he would have a man to stand in the gap. Somebody to say, God, please spare the city. Please spare the city. Please spare the city. I could take you to Cambridge when I pastored there for three and a half, 
three and a half to four years before we transitioned to Pastor Chrisman. When I was there for, uh, I remember when I first went there and began to pray, and God called me there. I remember after uh, 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 Thursday nights of teaching on prayer on the altar, talking about the altar was the only elevated instrument in the tabernacle because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men. Can I tell you, prayer is the most important thing we do. It's not singing, it's not preaching. It's not children's ministry. It's not youth ministry. Come on. It's not pickleball on Monday nights. It, the most important thing that a church can do is have an altar. What you're doing, young men, young women, on Saturday night at 7.30, what this church has been doing every day, Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. is the most important thing we can do. Because it's prayer that changes things. It's prayer that turns cities around. It's prayer that turns families around. And I taught on prayer week after week after week and all of a sudden I got lost into a spirit of prayer. How many know you can get into a spirit of prayer? It's where your heart, your heart becomes one with God. And I got on my knees and uh, I, at the end of that, I, it just fell on me. I got on my knees. If, if you were looking at the church in Cambridge, I was on this side where the baptismal tank is here. I knelt against the wall. I got lost in prayer. I didn't know how long I'd prayed. I forgot about anybody in the building. And I probably was a little bit um, uh, uh, boisterous in my prayer. Oh, God, God, touch this city. Don't let this city be lost. The drug addiction and the brokenness and the broken families. Oh, God, I'm asking you, Lord, to do a work in this city. Bring forgiveness, God. Don't let judgment come to this city. I got to a place where Isaiah 28 and 11 says, with stammering lips and another tongue would he speak. I was so moved by what I was feeling because I wasn't just there as a pastor. I was there standing in the gap for a community that needed God to move upon them. God works through prayer. God comes through prayer. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody. Prayer is the conduit that brings the power of God. By prayer and fasting, some things never break or change. It's by prayer. I'll never forget when I got up from that place. There, was about, there were about 20 people in that Bible study on a Thursday night. I'd been there pastoring for several months. When I got up, literally, folks, I could not speak in English. I was so moved in the spirit. I sounded like this. I got in my car and I began to drive. I was so moved. Why? Because James 5 says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much it does much good finally we're driving down the interstate when the burden began to lift I called my wife I said something shifted tonight Cambridge will not be the same something has shifted tonight the next time I got in the pulpit the next Sunday that was Thursday or Tuesday it was Tuesday excuse me when I got in church on the pulpit on Sunday I said everybody look at the doors I said they're coming they're on their way everybody shout they're coming that's what I told him the next few services here they came and in 21 days we baptized 23 people there were drug addicts drug dealers broken people that came God filled them with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know why? Because somebody's got to stand in the gap. Somebody's got to stand in the gap. Somebody's got to stand in the gap for a community, for young people that are broken, for marriages that are failed. Somebody's got to stand in the gap. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and pray, Turn from their wicked ways. Seek me and turn from them. Then will I hear from heaven. How many believe God hears us when we pray? Somebody shout amen. Stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. You know what that means? You stand in the gap, you're going to lose sleep. Stand in the gap, God might wake you up at 3 a.m. It might be 4 a.m. that you get up and you can't sleep. You can't. You toss and turn. Why? Because God's wanting you to feel what he feels. God's wanting to show you what he, he's, he's about to do. God's going to let you respond something that heaven is about to do because any time that God says he's going to bring judgment, he's about to bring mercy first. Did you hear me? Before judgment ever comes, mercy walks in the door. That's why the mercy and truth have, have met together.
Because truth can't get through the door without mercy first. You will never find it flip-flop, truth and mercy. It's always mercy and truth. Because the truth is judgment's going to follow sin. But mercy walks in the room first and says, but there's an opportunity to turn this around. You don't have to have the judgment if you don't want to. You don't have to have the curse of God if you don't want to. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. amen. And Jehoshaphat understood this. The Bible says that he set himself to seek the Lord. He, he called a fast. I will say there are principles in studying Jehoshaphat. It is this. He was willing to listen to the preacher. He was willing to obey the prophet. He was willing to understand that we need the voice of God in our lives. And the prophet did prophesy to him. And he came to him. He said, the Lord is a little bit up. The Lord's upset with you. He tells him in chapter 19, Jehu came to him and says, says Jehoshaphat, shouldest thou help the ungodly? Here you are trying to help Ahab and love them that hate the Lord. Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee and that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek the Lord. And, and all of a sudden you see something start happening. Jehoshaphat humbles himself before the Lord and said, I was getting ready to get bent out of way trying to help Ahab. The truth of the matter is I don't need what he's doing. I need what God's, are y'all with me right now? I need what God, be careful who you link up with. Be careful who you link up with. And he began to seek the Lord and he put judgment and the, the word and prop, he put the, the, Le, the, the Levites and the priesthood in place and he got it settled and he started seeking the Lord. Why? Because the Ammonites and the Moabites and the, the army of Seir is about to come against us. And it was here that he got the people fasting and praying. Could I say, when we step up here and we call a prayer and fasting, everybody ought to jump and be involved. Why? Because victory's on the way. Victory's on the way. I feel that right now. I wish somebody would receive that. Victory is on the way for my family. Come on, the Holy Ghost is here. Why don't you respond to the Holy Ghost that's within you? I think all over this building, somebody ought to reach out and say, victory's on the way. Victory's coming to my family. Victory. Victory's coming to my family. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody say, pray for me, preacher. I'm going to, but you've got to be praying too. Let's stand. Jehoshaphat led the people to a mighty victory. You know why? He sought the Lord. In this room right now, if you only understood your role as a believer, it's not just going to the house of God. It's building an altar between you and the Lord and your family. I think sometimes, where would I be if mom and dad hadn't prayed for me? Still today. I want y'all to live a long time. Long live the bounds. Because they cover me in prayer. The saints of God that cover me in prayer. I, I don't say this casually, but when Paul Nutter died, it shook me because I knew he's at this church every day praying for me. Very, very sensitive to the Lord when these people, the saints of God, because I believe in prayer that much. You do not want to live one day uncovered. Watch what happens if the covering goes away from a person. Now, God can take a person, a person can step out beside a covering and they'll, they'll, they'll lose this right here. They'll fall in deception. They'll fall in all kinds of things because they step away from covering. I, I, I felt this earlier about um, Samson's mother and father. Samson became disobedient, but his parents went with him. I'm, I'm convinced it meant they didn't stop covering him in prayer. God forbid we have a city that nobody's praying for and we have saints that nobody's calling the name for. I do. I try to cover every single person in this building during the week. God, bless them. I pray, I pray, preserve them, protect them, and prosper their way. But I don't stop praying for you once you walk out that door. Oh, no. Somebody called me this week that's been out of this church for a long time. They reached out to me the day that I was in here praying for them. That's no accident. I prayed for people before, and, and, and God, is it working? Is it, God, do I keep praying for them? They haven't been here in a long time. God, do I keep? And I felt the Lord said, don't give up on them. 
Because if I'm not praying for them, who's going to pray for them? God forbid your prayer where you die. And you find yourself with nobody covering you. Why? Because he said, I look for somebody to stand in the gap. I look for somebody that would cover them in prayer. And I couldn't find anybody. If you're not praying for your kids, who is? Pastor, I don't understand. Sometimes people make their own decisions. We're not robots. We're people of choice. But I believe God can bring people to a point, whether it's by the pestilence or the rain or the war or whatever, that they get to a point and say, I can't do it without God. And you're praying and God sends them mercy and grace. Conviction. I pray this. God, give them a dream. Remember, Dad, there was a young man. I, he prayed to the Holy Ghost not too long ago at the men's conference. We would pray, God, God gave him a dream, and in one dream turned him around. You know why? Because God went to him. God stirred him. I pray for you, and I pray for your children. God forbid we don't have anybody standing in the gap. Look here. Psalm 68. Somebody say, stand in the gap. Psalm 68, verse 6. God setteth the solitary in families. God setteth the solitary. That's the only place in Scripture the word solitary is used as a noun and not, a, and not an adjective. Solitary place. It means a person. And every family. In the, God setteth a person to be the intercessor. Those family members. I mean, that's true. Everybody gathers around grandma. Why? Grandpa, because she prayed for me. She went to church faithfully. She was the one that called day in and day out. Lord, don't let them be lost. God, don't let them be lost. Lord, send them a preacher. God, send them a preacher, oh God. God, let somebody, a believer, somebody talk to them, somebody witness to them. Oh, Lord, God, get a hold of their heart. Don't let them be lost. Don't let your judgment come against them, oh, God. Stir their heart that they would be, are y'all hearing me today? Who's going to stand in the gap? I believe God sent me here for, for Zanesville, there's no doubt. I believe God has sent you to your family. But it's going to be a Jehoshaphat experience that said, I'm going to set my heart to seek the Lord. I'm not going to be like Asa and, and I'm not going to be like Ahab. I want to hear what God's going to do in my generation. God is calling this church to a place of prayer. I'm asking everybody that can, I, I, especially our seniors because I know our youngers, y y younger families and adults are working, but every Monday through Friday for the next week, I want people in this sanctuary at noon praying. We got people at 7. We got, we got Bible studies, outreach, and things going on in the evenings. But I, I want noon, our seniors and people they can to be in this church at noon. Why are we going to do it at noon? It's going to be a high noon prayer. We're going to reach heaven. Who? Who for? One another. Family members. People that need God. Our city. I'm telling you right now, prayer is going to change everything in this city. We're not going to stop until we reach everybody that we can. We're going to reach everybody that we can. I believe God's calling you. Pastor, I'm not a preacher. You can stand in the gap. Pastor, I don't have a good voice to sing. You can stand in the gap. You can be a man of prayer and a woman of prayer. Y'all feel what I've taught you today? Who's going to stand in the gap? Who's going to stand? God, don't let them be lost. Or get a hold of their heart. Get a hold of their heart. I know I've preached with a burden today. I hope you can feel what I feel. I don't want to be uncovered or leave anybody uncovered. I want to pray for as many people as I can, but I can't pray for everybody. But you can pray for your family. Be a man and a woman of God that can stand before the throne of God and say, Lord, save my family. Don't let judgment come upon them. Would you lift your hands right now to the Lord and love God? Oh, God. Don't let them be lost. God, I can't save them, but I'm asking you to reach them. Be merciful to these people. Come on, God's wrath does not want to stay. He's slow to anger and quick to forgive. 
He's wanting you to stand in the gap for a family member who fasted in prayer. He's going to give much victory and greatness, but he needs somebody to stand in the gap in prayer. Hallelujah. They're going to turn on the music. Let this sanctuary be a place of prayer. I know we've got children in class. We're going to come back for our family worship service at 11 o'clock. It's going to be powerful. Our vans are going to be preaching. More people are going to come to God. I'm so thankful for that. But right now, I want this church to turn this sanctuary to a place of prayer. How many got people you need to be praying for? Or maybe you need prayer yourself. Mom and Dad, thank you for praying for me. Thank you for covering my babies in prayer.